Hey guys, just wanted to let you know this episode contains some sensitive topics that some might find disturbing. Body horror. If you find that you struggle with that kind of stuff, you might want to have a quick look in the description at some timestamps and we'll do our best to let you know when things are coming up that might be a little bit disturbing. Thanks for checking us out. Woo! Let's we get love into this. body horror! Oh no. We're spooked! Also, hey, real quick, Ava from the future here. We are starting a book club, so make sure that you have The Infinite and the Divine read or listened to on Audible or something. By the end of November, we're going to be doing a book club episode on it. It's going to be a great time. We've got some special guests coming on to talk about it it's gonna be so so fun we're super excited so make sure you have read the infinite and the divine by the end of november hello everybody and welcome to another episode of explaining warhammer to my girlfriend my name is ava and joining me as always is my lovely significant other carrie boo oh did i scare you it's time for a spooky spooky episode Today, we have a collection of spooky stories from the 41st millennium. Now, my love, there's a lot of horror in 40K. Uh, Oh, yeah. Like a crazy amount. It's kind of grim. So, dark. today, I have a collection of not all the horror, obviously. All of it. But I have a collection of pretty good short stories and little paragraphs and stuff that we can talk about just as a cool little Halloween episode. We are going to keep it in 40K right now, but maybe next year we'll do some fantasy horror. All cool. Age of Sigmar horror. Spoopy. There's a lot of horror to go around. Juan. But, my love. Yeah. Before we get into spooky stories. Spooky story time. You can support us over on Patreon. Leave us a like and a comment and subscribe. But we have an exciting announcement. We've got stickers. Stickers you can put on things. We've got a wonderful collection of our artwork put on stickers. Stickers. You can put it on your water bottle, your laptop, whatever you want, really. Your dog. Don't do it on a dog. Don't do it on a dog. We have a whole collection. Check it all out over at Orchidate.com. They are wonderful. They're high quality. The team over at Orchidate.com has been wonderful getting all of these and making them come to life, so to speak. We've got such great stickers such as, it is also a hammer. Look at him. Conrad Kurz suffering a mental breakdown. He's not okay. An adorable collection of Tyranids. Yeah, look, uh, this look at all this. Look at this one, guys. It's cute. You can find all of that and more over at Orchid8.com. Link in the description. Yeah. And if you want to get some energy, use code numbskulls at gamersubs.com for 10% off. This is exciting. We've got new microphones, so it's uh, like extra spooky. Guys, look, we're professional podcasters Finally. now. Finally. <laughs> Do you see how clear that was? Finally. At long last. I become my final form of white guy hipster. Oh. Finally. <laughs> of another person you, with a podcast. Did you know I have a podcast? We do. We like talk about stuff, but sometimes we're funny. Sometimes we get off on funny little tangents. Oh, wow. Yes. My love. Ugh. What's the thing that scares you the most? Um, the inevitability of nothingness and the void. That's fair. Me too. Yeah. My love, observe. Okay. Oh, wheel. Today we have a roulette wheel it's of spin. all of our stories. Wait, I'm going to get on it. Watch me go. Whee! Today, we have a collection of stories involving the Screaming Gallery, the Tyrant Star, the Ghoul Stars, Black Ships, Alensis, Corian 9, the map, Tiamat's Beacon, and what? Drukari Fun Times. We also have a special story that I'm going to read at the very end that okay. is my favorite Warhammer horror story. Uh, oh. But we have a lot to look forward to. Okay. Are I'm you scared. ready? Yeah, I'm ready. But I sh- can you be ready to be scared? I mean, you can. When you go into a horror movie, you, like, know what you're getting into, right? Yeah, but I regret it the moment I start. Nah. <laughs> You'll be fine. That's why I watch horror movies at home. I can turn it off. <laughs> Let us begin. We go. Spooky. We're going to spin the wheel. Spooky wheel. Oh, spooky. Spin. Oh. We've Wait. got... Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> right off the bat. Oh, no. Okay, so remember that content warning, guys? Now. It's now. The word fun times is ironic. Yes. My love, do you remember when we talked about the Eldari and how they accidentally yeah. summoned a god? But before it got bad. Ah, my girl. Slanash. That's right. Yeah. Okay. The freaks were in their home, the webway. Right. The ones who stayed in the webway eventually became known as Drukhari, Dark Eldar, okay. Dark Elves right. in space. Now, we have not done an episode on them just yet, but this is a good uh, brief 
into what their deal is. Okay. Uh, they are perhaps one of the cruelest factions in the entire setting. Cruelest, not coolest? Cruelest. Okay, there's an R in there. Guys. If your planet or your ship is being attacked by Drukhari, yeah. put that gun in your mouth. Right. So it's Reavers from Firefly, which you don't understand, but everybody in the audience, hi guys, probably does. Yeah. Death is a better alternative than to be captured by a Drukhari ship or just a, a group of them. Right. They actively seek out hedonistic torture of others to extend their own life because they discovered shortly after Slanesh's birth that Slanesh was slowly claiming their souls. I remember that bit. And they were like, well, how are we going to solve this? And they found out, right? because they were already freaks. They don't got no rocks. That if they absorb the pain and torment of another soul, right. that rejuvenates them. Right. And so they get to live forever so long as they do increasingly horrible acts. So it's like the people who have a blue check mark on Twitter. Yeah, you got their their rage baiting. <laughs> <laughs> the Drukhari are rage baiting. Right. Um, so they will, let's say you get captured by a Drukhari. Oh no. Can I get captured by Drew Carey? No. Dad? Okay. He's funny. Some things that can happen to you. Okay. If you're lucky. I have a very low pain tolerance. If you're lucky. They'll just torture you okay, that's until <laughs> they grow bored and just like, you know, discard you. No. Oh. If you're unlucky, they'll be like, oh, I'm done making you scream. Well, time to turn you into a sentient couch. I don't want to be furniture. Unfortunately, that's what they're going to do. So now you're a skin couch. You might even be turned into a biomechanical creature that seeks out to hunt and torture other people and bring them back to your dark masters so that they can torture them too. Isn't that fun? Like those weird military dog robots. You know, the ones that they kick and he doesn't fall over, but it's like, stop kicking him. Kinda, Yeah. I suppose. But like in a horrible body horror sense. Okay. Well, that's really unfortunate. Don't do that. Could they not do this? Literally no. Oh. If they don't do this, Slanesh just like gets them. I mean, take one for the team, man. I don't want to be claimed by Slanesh because Me imagine- neither, but I don't want to be tortured either. What do you think Slanesh is going to do to them? Okay, well, that's, sorry, your problem. Don't make it my problem. Granted, they are responsible for like, you know, making that happen. Yeah, don't make it my problem. <laughs> Get you a rock, put your soul in it. I'm very much looking forward to doing an episode on the Drukhari because I think their society is so interesting because they have the true born so to speak, where naturally born Drukhari and they have the the soul thing happening with Slanesh like constantly like tugging on them. They can always feel like her presence looming over them, mm -hmm. like she's about to pounce like a predator. And then they have clones who are like their rank and file and slaves and so on and so forth. And it's so interesting seeing books and novels and excerpts from their perspective because they have such a, so embedded into their society uh. that it's just so fascinating seeing it from that perspective of like, and then I went and sat on my skin couch and thought, man, I need a new skin couch because this one mm, kind of moldy. It doesn't cry as much anymore. So I need like that fresh torture. I need that fresh suffering. Your skin couch starting to crack. You keep having to put skin blankets <sighs> over it so the guests don't notice. Literally, That's embarrassing. yeah. embarrassing. Literally, yes. Yeah. Somebody's going to notice. I went to a party the other day. Oh. And the skin couch. A torture can, party? Can you, can you believe this? They had a skin couch. Oh, I love a skin couch. Made out of only two people. Imagine. That's not a skin my couch. Skin That's couch. a skin love seat. My God. I, I, I can't even believe it. The audacity. Oh. oh. It might as well be at Skin Chase Lounge. <laughs> <laughs> A skin stool, my God! You got your chase lounge made of coffin jockey. I ought to grab that man and put him in the arena. There's an arena? Oh, they love the arena. Thieves. Because it's nothing but, like, amusement and torture, right? And skin couches. I mean, if you lose. There are seats that are made of skin couch. Skin seats, yes. Couch is skin. <laughs> <laughs> He's like doing a funny little floaty thing. It kind of looks like the gentleman from Buffy. What's going on with his toesies? Drukhari are real spiky. Okay, he's got two very long toenails. Drukhari and Chaos are in a never-ending battle of who can put more spikes on them. Imagine if he was floating towards you menacingly and it was like a stone floor and his toenails were scraping across the See, stone See, but if floor. that was scary to someone, they would do that intentionally. Well, yeah, it's like when-, when They love when, the it's fear. It's like Freddy Krueger like with his nails yeah. on the wall. Yeah. But it's funny because it's his toes. <laughs> God. 
How spooky would you say Drukhari torture is? I mean, I you? don't want to meet one, but yeah. I, I feel like I'm going to answer that for all of these. That's fair. <laughs> My love, are you ready for the I'm next? I'm ready, I think. Let's spin the wheel. Okay. Spooky Let's get away from these guys. Spin. We have a skin wheel. It's... Uh-oh. Oh, black, black ships. ships. Those are just things that exist. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yay. Hooray. Black ships. Black ship. Black ship. Have you any sails? Something You're about not gonna like this one. bronze nails. You're not going to like this one. What do you mean all? I'm not going to like this one? Are the sails made of skin? Do you remember There's when... No we watched the Tithes episode, the one with the custodian lady. Yeah, she was rad. Do you remember what they were doing? Yeah. They what were, were they doing? They were getting psychers to put them in the juicer. Yeah, so... Smoothie time. They put those psychers on things called black ships. So yeah. those psychers are being put on something called a black ship. Right. Black ships are vessels that traverse between Imperium worlds in secrecy to collect psychers and bring them back to Terra, where, under certain conditions will be made into sanctioned psychers. It's like, hey, if you have enough psychic ability, if you have enough potential to become basically a wizard in 40K, oh. uh, we'll keep you around because cool. you're useful. Also, psychers don't live very long because they either go nuts or they just explode because they cast the spell wrong. Uh, oh. You know, that kind of thing. You know, it's, it's all based on emotions, right? But for the unfortunate lowest class psychers that don't meet the criteria will be amongst the 1,000 daily sacrifices to keep the Emperor of Mankind alive. For those who don't know, the Emperor of Mankind in current day 40K is a giant skeleton on a life support chair mm. and uh, daddy needs his juice. Gamer stuff. He needs his gamer stuff. <laughs> he used code numbskulls. We num should make a gamer subs and call it psych. No, <laughs> no. I have an excerpt here of a point of view of a psyker inside. Oh. oh, I don't like I think I read this on Reddit once, and I didn't like it. So, real quick content warning. This might get grim, dark even. Skoya opens her eyes. She is bound within her own coffin, bathed in tremulous sound. It rises octave by octave, and she thinks of deep sea monsters, ship-eating creatures stirring and thrashing upon the lightless ocean beds as they begin to rise. She breathes in, managing only a shallow mouthful of air. Her heart beats slowly. So slowly. She presses her hands to the thickness of the vision panel, knowing instinctively that it isn't for her to see out, it's for her captors to look in, to see her, to see if she's still alive. She screams for the spirits to come to her. She beseeches them for their aid. She curses them for their silence. Panic drives her past holiness into blasphemy, and still... She screams. Other cries join hers. Some, like Skoya's, beseech ancestor spirits or the memories of the lost. Others are offered up as desperate prayers to the emperor or the false and half-forgotten gods of distant worlds. It is the unified cry of people drawn from hundreds of cultures voicing their psychic gifts in terminal harmony. She is fading now. Her breaths no longer come, and that only amplifies her silent cry. She slumps forwards, cheek pressed to the unbreakable glass, her lips trembling, her eyes wide and shivering. The stiller she becomes, the darker her sight falls, the louder she screams inside her skull. And now, only now, does she hear the melody of the other souls of 1,000 sharing the same fate, suffering what she suffers. Their screams and prayers and panic and fears intertwine unseen by all and form one sound, one impossibly perfect note. Those outside the coffins may yet hear it, but its true purity is unheard by any but the dying souls themselves. It is the very first note in a song that will last 10,000 years and perhaps beyond. She, Skoya, is its first singer. Always look on the bright side of life. Yeah. Ba -boop, ba -doop, ba Turn into ba goo. I don't wanna. Turn into goo for your oh, god emperor. no. Can't they do something else? No. Why has it gotta be people? Because he need the psyker juice. It's okay, his favorite. Well, can we hook him up to like no. uranium no. or something? Like some kind of... Basically, the golden throne is slowly killing him. Then get off it. He can't. That sounds like a quitter attitude. They put him on the chair and well, he can't get up. Well, he's supposed to be in charge. He's a skeleton. 
a very powerful skeleton. He's like also not even conscious, basically. Well, and they're not doing a very good job with all these psychers. Basically, we do this psyker thing because it hasn't failed. Do we even know that it's actually doing anything? Yeah. Wait, what do you mean, eh? <laughs> it hasn't stopped working. Who started doing this? Were they like, he's running out of power, and then, so who thought of this? The chair is slowly killing him. We need to rejuvenate him. So did we make the chair by sacrificing a bunch of people? No, the golden throne was just there. It melts people when you use it, basically. It requires so much power to use that even the emperor cannot sit there and not, you know, deteriorate, because he's, Again, not conscious. Right. So in order to keep a balance to not have him die, right. we need to sacrifice a thousand psychers each and every day so that he doesn't die. Could we put a demon on the chair instead? Literally no. Oh, okay. Because if he goes off the chair, Tara dies. Well, you gotta do the Indiana Jones thing where you very <laughs> really quick. So being on the chair, Tara has a shield around it that right. protects it from demons. Demon. He's also basically in charge of keeping warp travel relatively safe. Yeah. If the emperor dies, quite literally, all hell breaks loose. The chair maintains an AT field. Yes. And the chair T field turns off if he gets up or if he dies. So he has to stay on the chair. What if somebody sat on the chair with him? He scooch over. I don't think he can. He's also, good luck getting there past booty. all of his custodian what guard. If, well, I'm, ju I'm just trying to come up with a solution. No. Oh. It hasn't worked. It Has hasn't... anybody tried? No! Oh. It's 40K! Oh. What would you rate black ships on, like, spook level? How spooky are a black ship? Um, Like, the thought of being Skoya in this excerpt. Well, I mean, like, it's, we need better management. <laughs> the Imperium, frankly, I think we should form a union. Uh, that, yes. <laughs> are you ready for the next horrible story? I don't know. Oh, it's time. Wheel! Everything we've done so far has had unfortunate furniture. It's fine. Oh, more unfortunate furniture. What do you mean? Karaya 9! Oh. Yay! Hey, you like Grey Knights? Oh, I do. My husband. So. I am the hammer. You know a smidgen about Grey Knights. You know that they hunt demons. Yeah. Now. Like bad asses. Yes. Their entire job is to hunt down demons and eliminate chaos. And look good doing it. It's true. They are. Look at them. They are dripped the fuck out. <laughs> so we haven't really talked about demon worlds yet. Demon, demon oh. worlds are either worlds inside the warp okay. or have been completely taken over by demons. Basically, it has been corrupted by chaos in some way, shape or form. Got it. Corian 9. Corian 9. Corian. Corian. Like Orion. Yes. Yeah. Corian 9 was a world that came under the control of Zinch cultists attempting to summon the demon prince Gargachaloth. Hang on. Wait, Gargachaloth? Gargachaloth, the demon prince of Zinch. Wait, okay, he sounds cool though. Gargachaloth? He's got a funny name. Does he have a funny model? No. Damn it. 300 Grey Knights were deployed to stop the ritual. That's a lot. However... The world had already fallen greatly to the corruption of the Changer of Ways. Okay. The following is a description of the planet shortly after the Grey Knight's arrival. It was a heaving sea of hatred, an ocean of pure evil. Far below the surface of Corian 9 was covered in a seething forest of torture racks, crosses and squares and stars of blood-stained wood on which were broken hundreds of thousands of bodies mangled and wound around the wood like vines around a cane. It was like a huge and horrible vineyard, with rows and rows of crucified bodies spilling a terrible vintage of blood into the earth. The victims were trapped between life and death, their bodies exsanguinated, but their minds just lucid enough to understand their agony. Their bodies were merged with the wood that had grown as seasons passed, twisting their limbs into canopies of fleshy branches and deforming them until there was barely anything human in them save for their suffering. They said the screams could be heard from orbit. They were right. Corian 9 would later be subjected to Exterminatus. They blew up the fucking planet. I mean... At that point, uh... fuck it. Well, this is unfortunate. So we've had a couple episodes where we're like, ha ha, funny demon. <laughs> but we need to remember, 
Chaos is fucking evil. Uh, you said this was Zinch? This was Zinchian corruption. This he, sounds more like Slanash. Well, the changer of ways. What if I changed you into a tree? Ha ha. Okay, so it's not that people are like nailed to trees. Well, they might have been at the start of it. Oh. But then the corruption got them. I see. Nobody in 40K is a good guy. Everyone sucks. Everyone is evil. But chaos is a special kind of evil. Uh, I, mean, I love chaos. it. Uh. I love the body horror of chaos. It's so gross and I love it. This is what Alberto did to that one village. Yeah. Turn them all into goo, basically. It was not a good time for yeah. that guy. Well, this is unfortunate. So you can see why the Grey Knights have such an important job, because ideally they would get to a world before this happened. I'm glad Karaya 9 is gone. It sounds like most people who were on it are probably glad it's gone, too. Yeah, unless their soul was claimed by Zinch. Ha ha. Ha ha, he he. I love chaos, dude. Oh, boy. I love the vibe of chaos. It's very similar to the Drukhari, where it's just, what's your faction's deal? I'm fucking evil! <laughs> yeah! Uh-huh, hee-hee. Ha-ha. I don't have any delusions. I'm fucking evil, motherfucker. Happy, happy, happy. What would you rate Korion 9 on a spooky level? Flesh planet. Don't you want to be a fun little tree? I mean, ant sounds kind of cool. Yeah, but like a flesh tree where you, you're you like... <laughs> flesh ant. <laughs> yeah, flesh ant where you're all like... You know, it hurts. That's pretty spooky. It's not great. It's not great. Oh, yeah. I don't like it. <laughs> um, Like, I'd prefer to not. I'd but at least you get exterminatus at the end. I mean, same thing with the black ship thing. I mean, yeah. But like, yeah. I get exterminatus at the end of this, too. That's <laughs> what? I'm going to die eventually. Oh, yeah. I mean, fair. But um, I'd rather be in the black ships than be yeah, a flesh tree. I, it sounds like they have a little less time, like, actively suffering. Yeah. They're probably at least given lunch on the way. <laughs> <laughs> you think they give them lunch? No. Well, they have to feed them something. I'm not saying they get like a club sandwich and fries. You get like the crumbs on the floor. Okay, well, they feed you they if they have maybe to. Maybe if they like actually give these people some nutrients, maybe they would have to use less of them to feed the chair. No. Club sandwich. It has to be a thousand. Life. Who figured that out? Someone. I'd Don't like worry to about see it. the name. I'd like no. to talk to this. But I got one more thing. <laughs> I saw this Why? feather. Why a thousand? <laughs> Why a thousand? Somebody ticked that number. Are we ready to go back to the spooky? Oh, wheel? the spooky the guy. Spooky I'm spooky. Mostly, I'm just like, oh shit. It's time for the Tyrant Star. Tyrant Star. The Tyrant Star. Okay. Comus, also known as the Tyrant Star, is a unusual stellar phenomenon in the Calixis sector. The star appears randomly, causing an increase in psyker births, chaos corruption, and inflicts mass panic and hysteria, including horrifying visions of the doom of humanity. Interestingly, it also alters the minds of those affected to accept and embrace this inevitable doom. The Inquisition is not certain of the origin of this phenomenon, and whether or not it's even a star is questioned. However, some scholars have noted that the word devour appears in several transcripts of these visions. However, the full transcripts are locked away, and only those close to Lord Inquisitor Zerbe are allowed to see them. Uh, evil fucking star. So, okay. It, it, oh, no. Star shows up. Star shows up randomly. Everybody gets depressed. And then they're like, yeah, I'm fine with Magic dying. Magic seems to be... Increased. Incre it's kind of like the comet in Game of Thrones. Yes. It's also similar to Morsleeb. When Chaos invaded in fantasy, one of the poles, the moon made out of warp stone, rose out of the earth. Okay. And very similarly, it appears randomly in the sky. And that's the night where it's like the dark magic is so crazy and like a bunch of evil stuff happens. It's very similar to that. Yeah, it's just a strange little phenomenon. I mean, it looks more like a black hole. It's an eclipse, I'd the, say. Yeah, more this devour word that keeps coming up that's in literature about like its past showing up time. The Inquisition has studied this star and they have met people who maybe their brain broke and they keep noticing the word devour is very, very common. Right. Maybe it's a tyrannid thing. Maybe it's a chaos thing. Maybe there's a demon who really wants to eat a bunch of people. Who knows? Yeah. What if it's an egg? Those. It's always an egg. It's always an egg. Bahamut's in there. You don't know. Oh, no, not again. Yeah. So it just shows up sometimes. 
are we worried that like it's gonna get worse or show up more often? It's just random. Oh. Hope you're not born in the Calixis sector. So it shows up in a certain area. It seems to be localized in the Calixis sector. Yeah. Because stars don't usually go in and out of being around. No, they don't, which makes it even stranger. Huh. Once Spook. again, very eerie. Very eepy. Not eepy. No. <laughs> Very the star is just eating. It, it's just going to bed. It's taking a nap. Shall we move on to I, the next? Yeah. Spooky. Spin the wheel. Ooh. Oh no. Oh no. Oh good. We haven't talked about the Night Lords yet, but this will be a good intro, much like the Drukari was. I know about Depressed Boy. Conrad Kurz. So. Conrad is an interesting case. Right. Where, you know Batman? I do. What if he and the Joker were the same person? Vigilanteism to the nth degree. Did you jaywalk? I will skin you alive to make other people scared to never jaywalk again. They love body horror. Okay. Like a lot. They love torture. It, again, very similar to Drukhari. Right. And I have an excerpt about the screaming gallery on Conrad Kurz's ship. Conrad's cursed ship. And I think the best way to get into it is to just read the excerpt for you. Okay. The walls, like so much of the Legion's fortress, were formed from black stone sculpted into forms of torment. Twist-backed humans arched and writhed motionlessly, captured at moments of supreme agony, their wide eyes and screaming mouths shaped by sadistic devotion. Shaped, not carved. Talos hesitated by the doors, his fingertips tracing over the open eyes of an infant girl reaching for the protective, worthless embrace of an older man, perhaps her father. Who had she been before the Legion raided her world? What had she done with her short life before she was dosed with paralytics and coated with rockcrete? What dreams were quenched by her living entombment within the hardening walls of a Primarch's inner sanctum? Or did she know, on some panicked, animalistic strata of her dying mind, that in death she would be part of something more momentous than anything she'd achieve in life? Within the stone she would be long dead. The mask staring out at a world immortalized her in the naive perfection of youth. No tracks of time across her face, no scars from battles against an empire that no longer deserved to stand. He withdrew his hand from her frozen face. The interior doors opened, bathing him in the warmth of the inner chamber. The screaming gallery was in fine voice tonight. An opera of bass moans, piercing cries, and the undulating chime of sobbing beneath the other sounds of sorrow. Talos walked down the central pathway, boots thumping on the black stone while the floor on either side of the walkway rippled and tensed with the pliancy of human expression, eyes, noses, teeth, and tongues poking from open mouths. The ground itself was a carpet of faces, flesh crafted together, kept alive by grotesque, baroque blood filters and organ simulator engines beneath the floor. As an apothecary, Talos knew the machinery well. He was one of the few charged to maintain the foul ambience of the screaming gallery. Robed servitors monotasked for the duty, sprayed gentle bursts of water vapor into the blinking eyes blanketing the floor, keeping them moist. I have a gallery and it screams and I like that it screams, so we got to make sure that it screams all the time. What do you mean? Wait, is it? Conrad's so, just a little quirky with it. He made it. It's out of people? He made a room out of people. How? Listen, Warhammer Meat science glue? is crazy. Yeah. He like flesh shaped a bunch of people together into a room. And there's just a little pathway that goes down it. And, uh, you know, it's like a garden that screams and made of flesh. Do they have minds? Can they communicate? They probably have enough sentience to realize that they are in pain. Hence the screaming. Why? Because Conrad's a little quirky with it. Okay. He loves the torture. He loves the torture. He loves it so much. But he specifically likes making little art projects. Yeah, because torture is... Beautiful, really. Society. Theater kid. <laughs> it's not a phase, Dad. So wait, outside there's a bunch of people in carbonite. In the room before the screaming gallery, yeah, there's a bunch of people in carbonite. 
And then you open to the main exhibit. Including babies. Yeah. Apparently, Conrad Kurz's chambers, like his personal chambers, are so horrible that one of his captains at some point went in and had to leave to throw up. Right. A space marine had to vomit. Right. That's insane. I can only imagine what's in there. Um, does anybody know about this? Yeah. Why don't they say maybe don't do that? They're chaos. So his brothers don't know about this? This is way after that. Oh. This is 40K. What is the first time he's like, you know what I should do? Like the day after he was born. Conrad oh. never had a chance. Right. Thanks, Biggie. There must have been signs. I think when we get to the Night Lords, it's going to be fascinating. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Their ideology is really interesting. Right. Because obviously they do all these horrible things. But that's what they were told to do. Right. They were terror troops. Yeah. Their entire purpose, like I said, you terrorize whatever planet you're attacking. And then out of fear, they come over to the Imperium. Right. And then when the heresy happened, everyone was like, yo, fuck the Night Lords for doing all that crazy torture bullshit. And the Night Lords, most of them were like, what the? That was my job. Right. You you told me to do this job and I did it. Right. And they're like, ah, oh, fuck you. I mean. So there's a lot of night lords who are like, fuck it. Right. I don't serve anybody. Okay. I don't serve the gods. I don't serve the Imperium. I'm doing my own thing. Base. Every chaos marine thinks that they're the most free, but night lords definitely believe that they are free, so to speak. This sounds like most depictions, or at least some depictions, of like the Catholic purgatory. Yeah. Which is yeah. not a great place to be. They love endless torture. It's their favorite thing. The Night Lords, I mean. I like that they're watering them like plants. Well, yeah, you got to keep them moist. Do they feed them? Does somebody come in with a spoon? and? Like... No, they're kept alive by the engines beneath the floor. Well, darn. It's like a giant servitor. Yeah, but they have servitors. Would you rather be I, no. in the screaming gallery as part of the exhibit? Or would you rather be the servitor tasked with just like, you know? I would rather eat a dirty dish sponge. Ooh. Ooh. I know. Fair. Yeah. What would you rate the screaming gallery on us on a spook level? Incel. It, whoa. (laughs) No, no, no. He's not an, he's kind of an incel. Conrad picks up a girl and he's like, hey, babe, let me show you my screaming gallery. That's a red flag. takes her and she's like oh this is awful and he's like women <laughs> it feels they like never appreciate me oh dude that would be such an interesting story a human is brought onto the night lord's ship don't and it's like don't go into the screaming gallery and she's like what's the screaming gallery and they're like haha don't worry about it here's this key by the way um anyway but, like, they would do that. Yeah. They would totally do that because they would just be watching her on camera and going, like, oh, yeah, yeah, we love that torture shit. She's going in the gallery. They would, like, broadcast that to her home planet to be, like... What is this, the Hunger Games? Well, again, terror tactics. They're fucked up. They're also Bricky's favorite chaos what? faction. <laughs> Bricky! Why? <laughs> he loves the, He loves the skinning, okay? This oh, is Bricky. why he doesn't hang out with flesh tubers anymore. It's okay, he Bricky. he doesn't get the urges. I think Night Lords are cool, YouTubers. too. I mean, I'm not saying I don't think the Night Lords are cool. Look, drip immaculate. I love it's the little true. wings the on bat. the helmet. It's so fucking funny. But screaming gallery. Yeah, not great. Less cool. Aesthetically, peak. Ideologically, problematic. Ooh. Well, I don't know. I like the freedom thing. I, I think that's freedom. cool. But then they're like, I'm so free. I want to skin a baby. Aaron it's Yeager like, was Whoa. also into freedom. <laughs> Conrad is just sitting there going like, I have to do the rumbling. <laughs> Bricky. <laughs> it's okay, Bricky. I like them. I'm not saying I don't like them. I'm just saying. Ignore her. It's okay. Bricky, you and I can have lunch and talk about how cool the Night Lords are. Okay, I'm Carrie gonna... doesn't have to be there. Wait, so you're getting lunch, but the psychers aren't? <laughs> what is this? It's time to spin the wheel oh, again. Yay! Yeah. The... I hate society. <laughs> so does Conrad. Ah, uh, it's time for another eerie one. The map. Aren't these all eerie? Well, this one is just kind of like mysterious. Oh, I love a mystery. So, the map. During the Great Crusade, the Imperium of Man right. went and conquered a bunch of worlds. As you do. Sometimes they had Eldar. Sometimes they had orcs. Right. Sometimes they had humans. Sometimes they had weirdo gene mutants, etc., etc. 
Planets could have anything on them. Okay. And one time they went to a planet that was completely empty. Oh. As in, no one was there. It's not like there wasn't a society. It's almost as if they had just disappeared. Okay. They vanished. Spooky. Like one of those towns in Nevada where there's just where nobody there. Just <laughs> suddenly they're gone. And I have an excerpt from a space marine who was there when they were searching this planet to see if they could find anything. And he says, No more than 10 years ago, we found a dead world where life had once been. A species had lived there once and either died out or moved to another world. They had left behind them a honeycomb of subterranean habitats, dry and dead. We searched them carefully, every last cave and tunnel, and found just one thing of note. It was buried deepest of all in a stone bunker ten kilometers under the planet's crust. A map. A great chart, in fact, fully 20 meters in diameter, showing the geophysical relief of an entire world in extraordinary detail. We did not at first recognize it, but the Emperor, beloved of all, knew what it was. It was Terra. It was a complete and full map of Terra. Perfect in every detail. But it was a map of Terra from an age long gone, before the rise of the hives or the molestation of war with coastlines and oceans and mountains of an aspect long since erased or covered over. Just an old ass map of Terra. It's just a printout of Google Earth. Yeah, but what the fuck is it doing here? Okay, so spooky. No one's there. No one's there, but there's definitely like signs that long, Something long lived ago, there. Whether it be human or an alien species. Some kind of intelligent life form. Yes. That we're able to like build and stuff. And only in the deepest part of the earth inside of this tunnel system, in the very, very, very deepest part, right. was this map of Terra. Okay. What just the sitting there? fuck is it doing there? Like in a chest? Like, it was just there. Na, na, na. I mean, I would say that's like not that unbelievable. It's a little bit strange. But also, we're talking, we're in the 30th millennium. We're like 39th millennium at this point. This is during the Great Crusade. I don't so know what year that was. 30K. Okay. Which is based on our timeline. So, like, we're in the year 2024. Yeah. So, this is basically 30,000 years. In the future. Yes. So, they've found a map of, modern like, day. modern day Earth. Yes. Before global warming. Florida's still there. Oh yeah, Terra in 40K and 30K like doesn't have oceans. There's no oceans. Right. Like the entire planet is like a, it, it's a planet city. That is so, you know, there's layers and layers and layers. Basically, if you were a pilgrim and you wanted to go see the emperor, great, your great, 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 great grandchildren are going to be able to actually see him. It is impossibly big. And it's also a nightmare. Yeah, okay, cool. We love that. It could even have nothing to do with the whoever lived here before. It could have been a traveler went and had this map. The doctor was there. I mean, it could be Trazin for some reason was in and out. <laughs> Oricon. He's particularly interested in humans. Oricon, I found a funny prank. <laughs> I've thought of something very funny. But I don't know. It, it could be Trazin, but also I feel he would take that map and put it in his gallery. Yeah, but maybe he just made a photocopy. <laughs> I don't think he totally he's... has like one of those old school photocopiers and a fax machine, but he's hooked it up to like a time warp device that Orkin made it so he can fax into the past. Orkin's meditating over the course of like 10,000 years and he's just trying to become his astral self. And then he just hears the fax machine activate and he turns around and he picks up the piece of paper and it just says, you're a bitch signed <laughs> Traz. <laughs> With like a cute little like. <laughs> yeah. And then it prints another page and it's just full black both sides. Oh, that's mean. That's fucked up. But then, you know, in order to connect it, he's got, he's got to use the dial up. He's like, okay, I need you to connect to the machine. And then it does the like, and he's like, I hear this is like something that they call the screaming gallery. Yes. I would like to see the screaming gallery. Oh, horror is beyond my comprehension. <laughs> What would you rate the map on terms of spook? One. It's yeah. not that spook. It's just like. It's, it's mysterious. It's a why, not an it's oh like, God. Yeah, that's fair. I like the map. I think. I think the map is cool. I, I want think, to investigate the map. I think it's eerie. My brain goes to, well, why was it there? Who made it? Where did these people go? I love that stuff. It's yeah. very 
Silent Hill, there was a hole here. It's gone now. Right. And you're just left with that. And you go, but why? What does that mean? But I also feel like given that we're talking about the universe, all of space and time. Okay. It's like when you find a pamphlet on the side of the road and you're like, what does it mean? And it's like somebody just dropped this pamphlet. No, that's different. But is it? It is. I'm just saying. I disagree with you fundamentally. Oh, on this. he pulled out my line. Like, yeah, there's probably something to it. There's probably a reason this map ended up in this like cave and stuff. But it might be as innocuous as somebody took shelter in this cave. Yeah, but that's not fun. Oh, that's fair. I mean, neither is the fucking screaming gallery. I think it's pretty funny. Not for them. Yeah, but you know, they shouldn't have been there. <laughs> It's just, uh, hey, listen, we're free. We're not corrupt. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we live in a capitalist society. It's time to spin the wheel. Oh, Tiamat's bacon. Bacon. I'm hungry. <laughs> Bucko. We're back with Tyranids. I love Tyranids. Hey, if you think Tyranids are cool, check out those stickers. Tyranids. So we talked in our Tyranid episode, we mentioned High Fleet Behemoth, oh. Kraken, oh. and Leviathan. But there are many high fleets. Right. Ogo Pogo. And this high fleet is known as Tiamat. And they have something going on with them. It's a little odd. High fleet Tiamat, like all high fleets, has unique quirks, such as their natural defense against energy weapons with diamond hard carapaces. Excellent. The behavior displayed by high fleet Tiamat is one of great concern. A group of Eldar rangers were the first to enter the Tiamat system and make contact with the high fleet. They found a continent-spanning organic structure formed out of biomass. Oh. Upon going near it, the beacon pulsed oh. with psychic energy, okay. the intensity of which was so much that the rangers had multiple seizures and had to flee the system oh, as no. soon as possible. Oh, dear. Later... A Death Watch kill team of space marines would be deployed to investigate the structure, and once again, upon going near it, the structure pulsed with this psychic energy and instantly killed the kill team's librarian. What? And it also alerted the High Fleet that they were there. Oh. The rest of the kill team did not survive. Oh, no. But not before sending their findings to their gunship that did manage to escape. The Ordo Xenos has not come up with any conclusive evidence as to what the structure's purpose is. However, it is clear that it is not finished. The giant spire thrums with psychic energy, luring more Tyranids to it. Hive ships have become concerningly common, and each day more Imperium ships are taken by gene stealer cults to become biomass fed into the massive structure. All attempts to destroy Tiamat's beacon have so far failed. It's just a giant spire that kills psychers. It's like a lighthouse. And it kills psychers. Of death. You know how the Emperor's like the bestest psyker that has ever been? Right. He's like a god level the entity. Number one. What if this gets finished? Okay. And it pulses. Right. And every psyker, including him, die. Well, then I guess we're screwed with that chair thing. I guess we're screwed with the chair thing. I don't know how this would affect demons, yeah. considering they are warp entities. Yeah. Also... It's like a big, different use of the shadow in the warp. It's like weaponizing it, yeah. yeah. And it's like, what if it just pulsed to the shadow in the warp, and maybe it does finish, and it goes throughout the entire galaxy. All psychers are gone. Pretty much any warp entity is either gone or weakened to a massive degree. Like, I just don't know what this... What is the plan? What is this thing? Well, what came to mind when you first started describing it, because obviously it's like a biomass thing, mm -hmm. is the biggest life form on Earth is actually a giant fungal colony that mm -hmm. takes up like several states wide or something like that. I can't remember exactly, but it's freaking huge. Yeah. Right. It's bigger than any animal. But it is technically a living thing. Yeah. Because of the way that fungus and plants work, it's able to just keep growing out and out and out and out. Plants and fungus and stuff, they don't have brain waves in the same way we do. They do react to external stimuli at times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it like felt psychers, those Eldar Rangers, yeah. that kill team librarian, it like must have felt their presence and then thrummed and it just, you know? Yeah. Something... Was going it's on like there. a self-defense mechanism. We gotta send in a bunch of silent sisters. Mm, 
Sisters of Silence would probably be able to take care of this problem. One problem with that, this is arguably going against a entire Tyranid swarm. Right. The Sisters of Silence are not many in number. Okay. There are not a lot of them around. Right. I think a story involving investigating this thing would go so hard, like make it kind of dead spacey. Ah. Uh. Like maybe somehow a space marine kill team that doesn't have a librarian, they manage to get into it. And it's just this, like an anthill. And they're just trying to find out like, what the hell is it? What's going on with it? I think it's very spooky. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's mysterious and like, uh oh. This could be a problem. Yes. But I mean, that's also like the whole Tyranid MO. Yeah, of just like the inevitable munch munch. Who knows how big this could get. Mm -hmm. I think it puts an interesting look into how the different high fleets interact. Yeah. And how they behave. Like we know that Tyranids, the word might not be intelligent, but like they're organized. They They use guns. Yeah, they have processes. They understand when something is important. Like in Space Marine 2, there are plenty of missions where a generator is like activating or something and suddenly they start swarming that generator because they, or at least the hive mind, understands that that's important or this bomb's going to go off so they like spread out. You know, they are, again, to a degree, intelligent. Yeah. And it's spooky. This feels intentional. They are intentionally building something. Like this thing, it's like, you know, how bees or wasps make like honeycomb. Yeah. And it's like this fascinatingly intricate. They're building a nest. Something is going on. Yeah. The fact that we don't really understand it and that it is so volatile isn't great. No, I rate this a spooky. It's a spooker. We only have three stories left, my love. Are you ready? I am here for it. We've got a short one, a medium one, and a long one. Okay. So hopefully we we get the short one first. Furniture one. Um, mm, let's spin the wheel. Yay! It's time for Olensis! Oh boy. This is the short one. Okay. Olensis is a demon world. Okay. We talked about demon worlds. Horrible places. Yeah, not good. Olensis is a planet corrupted by the Dark Prince, Slanesh. (gasps) Oh! And upon first glance, you would think, oh, it's just a normal planet, uh, until you got closer. Olensis is actually a giant human that is curled into a fetal position, and they're just this ball of meat, basically, and demons, beastmen, noise marines, Slanesh cultists, they live on This planet. Okay. They make a base here and they live inside of his giant pores and other orifices. Um, Oh, no. They're bacteria. Yeah. They're basically the bacteria for this giant meatball man. Not great. I love a meatball, but this isn't. But this is extreme. Oh, no. In M37, St. Basilius found 30 space marine chapters lacking faith, something that happens very often, actually. They were given the choice of death or crusading directly into the Eye of Terror. This was known as the Abyssal Crusade. So, lacking faith is a generous way of saying, mm, I don't like you. Oh. I, d- I told these space marines to do something, and they said, no. Right. They're lacking faith. Right. Insubordination. Mm. Either you die, or you go on a crusade as penance. So, unfortunately, the Sentinels chapter came across Olensis. And they landed on the planet and started, you know, doing space marine stuff. They were destroying demons and they were destroying the chaos marines. And the battle got so intense that Olensis woke up. Oh, no. And it ate everyone. Oh, no. To survive inside of the literal belly of the beast, the Sentinels resorted to cannibalism and eventually went insane. When they eventually escaped, they had already fallen to Slanesh fully, becoming the Corpus Brethren. And might I say, their color scheme is fucking tight. White armor with like a bronzy kind of trim. Love that. That is clean as hell. Now granted, I wouldn't want to meet any Chaos Marine, but especially I wouldn't want to meet one who is probably definitely going to eat me. I don't think I'd want to meet most space marines. Uh, Listen, hey, if a Slaneshi marine comes up to me and is like, hey, Hey, boy, you be looking like a snack, I'd be like, ha ha, hee hee. But these ones would be like, you're 
You're looking like a snack. Rolling a bit. So yeah, so, that's the story of Valensis and the unfortunate Sentinels chapter, who are it, now the Corpus Brethren. It feels a bit like in Sinbad when they realize that they're on a fish, not an island. Yeah, it's very much that. It's very, uh-oh. Uh-oh. Okay, so this planet is a person yeah. who is balled up in yeah. a fetal position and, and floating through space. In the warp. In the warp. Yeah. Is there just oxygen in the warp? Yeah, magic. So they don't necessarily have to breathe? Just a big ball, man. They don't necessarily have to eat other than these guys were around. Yeah. Is it human or humanoid? Good question. It might have been human at some point. Oh. Maybe it was some person who got into Slanesh through like the excess of gluttony. Right. You know, lots of gluttony. Yum, 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 yum. And maybe Slanesh was like, how big you want to be, boy? And this person was like, I want to be the biggest ever. And Slanesh was like, bet. Jim, Digivolve 2. Olenses. Cool. How would you rate this out of a spooky? Not great. Uncomfortable. I want to make a Corpus Brethren kill team because I think... Fashion is different from well, impact. Well, hold on. Aesthetically, they're peak. No, now, I-, I also want to make a kill team where if I'm fighting someone and they're like, hey, what's your kill team doing here? I want to look at them in the eye and go, they're hungry. They want to eat you. I've got like that tear in it in me. You know what I mean? I'm just like, it's so simple of just like, I put them on the board. They're like, what's the goal here? It's like, they want this objective so that they can, you know, they're hungry. They want to eat you. When I'm making my kill team. Yeah. Can I play the planet? <laughs> I put a rubber ball on okay. the field and I go, this is Olense. I'll just get a big, one of those silicone sex dolls. No. Tie them up. No. Cover them in some dirt. My love. Yeah. Let's spin the wheel. We've only got two stories left. Now, you might notice, dear viewer, that there's only one story on here, but I said that there's two left. That's because I saved the last one because it's my favorite. So let's see what we get. What's it going to be? I bet it's going to be the ghoul stars. Oh, Oh my God. We were right. The ghoul stars. Hey, now. You're a ghoul star. Get your ghoul on. My love, what was the model kit that you most recently bought? I got flayed ones. You want to learn about the flayed ones? Yeah. This is not exactly exclusively about them, but it's mostly about them. The Ghoul Stars. The Ghoul Stars is an area of the galaxy dimly lit by dying suns. Oh, God. The border of which is monitored by the Imperium, but rarely do they enter deep enough to discover what lies beyond. Those who do are never seen again. The deepest region of the Ghoul Stars are inhabited by a variety of dangerous Xenos races, most notably Necron Flayed Ones, in the Bone Kingdom of Drazak. These Necrons, who have contracted something known as the Flayer Virus, have been exiled to this part of the galaxy. The Flayer Virus has been a threat to all Necrons since the destruction of the Catan known as Landugor, who, when killed, cursed the Necrons to hunger for flesh. Because he was a Catan, like a literal star god, when Catan die, reality breaks, essentially. Okay. Which is why they don't kill Catan anymore. Right. They just split them up into shards. They put them in a bottle. They put them in Pokeballs. Like balls. that thing Bricky has on his thing behind him. I don't know. I don't know. He keeps a stuffy in a, in a jar. Oh, maybe I don't want to have lunch with Bricky and talk about Night Lords. I changed my mind. I'll have lunch with you, Bricky. <laughs> Those with the Flayer virus undergo several changes in an uncertain span of time. The desire to seek out, consume, and wear flesh is a constant, sometimes overwhelming feeling. Death masks, torsos, and limbs will elongate, fingers becoming sharp claws. The eyes of the Necron will turn to a dim white, and the ability to speak slowly fades away. Flayed ones primarily communicate through a series of taps and clicks and scratches of their fingers on metal. But when the time comes to hunt, they are completely silent, tearing open reality with their claws and ambushing their foes from the darkness, only to slip back into their own pocket dimension, waiting to ambush their prey once again. However, they cannot truly consume or digest their desired meal. Some flayed ones have been observed slamming their face into a pile of meat for hours on end until the viscera becomes paste. This has led to the idea that flayed ones do not display intelligence and therefore cannot use advanced tactics. Though, if you were to ask a guardsman unfortunate enough to ever encounter these creatures and survive, they would tell you that this is far from the truth. Ah. Oh no. Oh boy. Spooky 
skin man. Well, we love a skin man. Villain in disguise. Skin couch, skin man. Everything's better with skin on it. If you like the idea of Flayed Ones, right. might I recommend reading the Twice Dead King series? Okay, but everybody says I'm going to cry. They're sad, but they also talk about how Flayed Ones work. Okay. And they're creepy. Okay. They're very creepy. They crawl around the taps and the scrapes to communicate. Okay. At one point, there is a space marine who is like standing looking for enemies and there's a flayed one standing behind him. Okay. And it's like literally double his size. Right. And it looks at the protagonist and holds up its finger to shush him. Okay. And then tears that poor space marine apart. Everything up to the tearing just sounds like they make ASMR videos. <laughs> Oh, no! They're like... Or wait, let me get up. Let me get up. I don't have nails right now. I'll have to do this when I get home and record. They're like, hey, guys. Welcome to... Uh, wait, what's the place called? Uh, The Bone Kingdom of Drazak. The Bone Kingdom of Drazak. I'm here. I'm gonna... We're gonna relax. And then we're gonna murder a guy. Like... Uh, 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 uh. One second. I just heard someone come into the door. Five Nights at Freddy's scream. I mean, I think they're very cool. They feel like the most out of what we've talked about. They feel the most like horror movie. Yeah. Like I would love a. They're a little Jeepers Creepers. I would love a movie. Predator. Yeah. Like give me a story of a bunch of space marines on like a ship and somehow a bunch of flayed ones get on board. I think there was a five minute short that Games Workshop released that was like Death Watch versus Flayed Ones. But I want like a full horror movie of like, it's in the walls. Like Alien. It's in the walls. Yeah. Yeah. I think that Games Workshop should flesh out the Flayed One range and give them their leader because they do have a leader. They have a king. His name is Valgul. Okay, that's cool. The Bone King. Right. Not the flesh king. No, the bone king. Because it's the bone kingdom and he's the bone king. Also, every time we talk about the flayed ones, I giggle for a minute because the flare virus is a thing in the Maze Runner series. Oh. That's what makes all the like spooky zombie people similar. Kinda they do similar, give a yeah. zombie quite a bit. Zombies don't eat for nutrients, right? No, they, they're very- It's a compulsion. Yeah, Necron zombies. And it's it's so cool. I love flayed ones. No, I think they're really cool. How would you rate this on a spooky range? I would not want to be in a room with Good one God, of these. Good God, no. Um, I wouldn't want to. That's some nice skin you got there. Well, yeah, I moisturize. Be, be a shame if, uh, you know, I, you know, I'd like that skin. Okay, well, set a fill. But he wouldn't say that. He would go like hyaluronic acid. It does wonders. They just need. He would get me in with They just need a good routine. They just. He'd be like sneaking up on me in my bedroom and I'd get more relaxed. Because like I listen to ASMR when I go to sleep. All right, guys, we're going to ambush Gary. And we're going to slowly open the door. Okay. I'm hopping out of my pocket dimension. I'm crawling on the ground. And I'm just like, oh. Oh, I'm so relaxed. Great. <laughs> No, they're very spooky. I love them. But they're like cool spooky. Yeah, no, they're like, they're monster -y. Everything we've talked about today, in my opinion, has been cool spooky. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, but I like like when I watch horror stuff, I like the genre of horror that is like, there's a monster. Yeah. Or there's something supernatural to it. I love like, a I monster. I like other things too sometimes, but those are what I tend to be interested in. So for me, this is much cooler than like a screaming gallery where it's just like a psycho. <laughs> Which like I that's mean, fair. I like Psycho. That's fair. But you and I really like the monster. Yeah. No, that's fair. The alien thing that you don't understand. You haven't seen Predator. No, I haven't. We should watch Predator. We should. I think you would like Predator. Yeah. It's not necessarily a horror movie, but it's what we were talking about, like a cool monster, and it's kind of got like, oh, where is it? Oh. Uh. You know how sometimes people will make like a little diorama to like have their little army, but they give them furniture or something. It'd be fun to give these guys like a little tea party <laughs> with like a bunch of like flesh mashed on the table. Oh no. One of them's got one of those funny British hats, the fascinators. That's very similar to an Age of Sigmar faction called the Flesh Eater Courts. They're a bunch of ghouls and like vampires and stuff Wait, okay. who are literally delusional. They think 
that they are noble knights and like royalty. Okay. But to everyone else, it's, you know, horrible like cannibals. Cannibals and stuff like that. Right. But to them, they see like, I rode out on my majestic steed and I had my amazing armor clad cavalry behind me. And you're just seeing like these horrible monsters crawling around and you're like, whoa, what the hell? But it's so cool. It's just, they're Delulu. It's a little bit Hill House. (laughs) Yes. Yes, actually. Okay. You're not seeing the same thing that they are seeing. Because I like that kind of thing. Like those kinds of ghost stories. We'll like. talk about them and their leader, Usheron, the Grand Mortark of Delusion. I'm impressed you pulled that out of your memory. Yep, because it's such a cool fucking title. Hey, are you ready for our final story? I guess. This is my favorite 40K short horror story. Okay. It's called The Vanishings of Fornax Alf. Okay. Turn off the lights. Get it all spooky. Uh-oh. Oh, now I'm spooked. Yes. Fornax Alf as well as being the location of a famous imperial victory, was also the site of one of the most unnerving and inexplicable episodes of the early crusade. By 757, long-range fleet recon had established Fornax Alf to be an enemy bastion with significant hive cities and what appeared to be a fleet reserve. Heavy fighting was expected in system, and Slado, person directing this, directed an invasion force of the guard under General Jader Elbeth to prepare for assault. Elbeth's resource of nine regiments, two of which were armor brigades, was to be further reinforced by the Iron Snakes, fresh from their intervention at Ambled 11 the previous year. The Iron Snakes are a Space Marine chapter. I like snakes. Yeah, they're cool. The assault was delayed twice because of warp storm activity, the second outbreak of which forced the Iron Snake battle barges into a four month holding pattern at the Albania Beacon. Elbeth's invasion fleet suffered warp storm perturbation and was scattered. As a result, Elbeth arrived at Fornax Alf with only a third of his complement and with no sign of the promised Astarte's support. Elbeth, a cautious man of great tactical wit, initially and rightly aborted his assault run, realizing that he was too poorly supplied with men and munitions to take an entire world. He moved his career ships to an out-of-system translation point and prepared to hold there until reinforcements arrived or, in the event of an attack, translate out to safety. However, Elbeth decided to not waste the opportunity of being so close to the target world and directed the rapid pursuit frigate Ziegler to undertake an intruder pass through the Fornax Alf inner system to assess enemy strength and disposition. The operation took place on the 303rd day of 757. To the bafflements of Elbeth's Tactica staff, the Ziegler encountered zero resistance. No orbital defense batteries fired on it, no ships were launched to engage. The Ziegler reported the high anchor points and orbital yards to be entirely empty of ships, either military or commercial. Furthermore, it found no trace whatsoever of electromagnetic activity on the world's surface. No Vox substrate, no power or industry, no motion. The great hives of Fornax Alf read as empty and dead. No vault could be identified in either Ziegler's findings or its Auspex systems. The following day, the cruiser Claudia, Elbeth's flagship, repeated the run. Identical results were obtained. Not only was there no sign of human life in Fornax Alf's hives, the hinterlands and countrysides were also empty, quashing the notion that the inhabitants had fled the cities for the safety of the rural interior. Confronted with this baffling evidence, Elbeth decided to take advantage and land a spearhead force in advance of the reinforcements. A week after the intruder passes, he deployed his units, two full regiments of rollback heavy infantry, the 34th and 52nd fighting felids, and the Vitrian 10th Armored Brigade, a total of 16,000 men and 800 fighting vehicles. The assault by drop pod and lifter was made at night and bracketed the central hive of Trisum. Elbeth led his forces in person. There was no resistance. Elbeth's forces found a world entirely devoid of life. The great hives were empty, as if the vast population had vanished in an instant. Half-eaten meals were found on hab tables, half-finished games of regicide in street parlors. There was no power, but it was easily restored by a team of engine seers. Elbeth initially suspected plague or some other great mortality, but there was no bodies or burial pits, no sign of struggle or disaster. The population of Fornax Alth had simply disappeared, without explanation, leaving behind an eerie, vacant world. 
Elbeth fortified his position in preparation for reinforcement. It is evidence from his log that he was unnerved, and a sense of haunted discomfort settled on his men, even the ordinarily stoic Vitrians. Most chillingly of all, odd, anguished screams were reported throughout the hives, often at the dead of night. No source or origins for the screams was ever found. Elbeth sent extensive reports back to Slato, appraising the War Master of what he called the fearful absence, the fearful absence we have uncovered. On the first day of 758, transmissions from Elbeth's Liberation Force ceased. Delayed by warp storms, the Iron Snakes arrived on Fornax Alf 80 days later, 300 strong. They made planet drop immediately, under the command of Brother Captain Kewels. The normally unruffled demeanor of the proud Iron Snakes was markedly absent from their brief initial signal to Slado, War Master. My lord, there is no one here at all. Fornax Alf was as empty as Elbeth had found it. Distressingly, there was now no sign of Elbeth and his Liberation Force either. His ships had vanished from orbit, and there was no sign of the landed units apart from two drop pods that were washed up on the beach at Sindranol. Whatever mysterious fate had befallen the population of Fornax Elf had now overtaken Elbeth's men too. The Iron Snakes spent a month scouring the planet for clues, and their battle barges searched the nearby inn system. No sign of Elbeth or his sizable force was discovered save for a single Vitrian tank, a Lehman Rust Conqueror that was found 80 stories up on the roof of a hab stack in Chaisum. All the Vox headsets were missing, apart from the last 30 centimeters of cord plugged into the outlets. The ends of the cords had been severed and somehow fused. No sign of the crew remained, apart from a single gauntlet in which a calcified human hand was found still gripping the gearbox lever. Three days later, one of the battle barges detected what appeared to be the Claudia in fatal orbit around the system's sun. The ship, whatever it was, succumbed to the gravity and was burned up before it could be formally identified. It is only proper to suggest that the Iron Snakes were unsettled by the situation. Slato signaled them to withdraw before a similar nameless fate befell them too. But on the 130th day of 757, circumstances changed again dramatically. A comet or meteor, previously undetected, struck Fornex Alf in the polar regions. The impact was catastrophic, and many great natural disasters followed, including the collapse of the northern ice shelf and the eruption of a volcanic chain in the southern hemisphere. The Iron Snakes rode out the devastation and the nuclear winter that followed. But the impact had brought with it a more shocking consequence. Hordes of demons, or demon things, infested the empty planet, pouring out of the blasted north to congregate around the hives. A ghastly, furious war then began, with the Iron Snakes besieged by the infernal beasts. For a fuller account of this, the reader is directed to Festwick's masterful Long Night of Demony, and also the archives of the renowned chapter of Ithaca, Codex 3345.6, Spool 4591. In the first month of 759, the delayed portions of Elbeth's assault force arrived in system and deployed in support of the Iron Snakes, but by then, the Valiant Marines had destroyed the demonic entity and emerged victorious. This long battle through the Endless Night, as Kules called it, had cost them dearly. But Fornex Alf had been cleansed. The heroic fortitude of the Iron Snakes had now won them two of the most famous victories in the early crusade, though both feats would be eclipsed by their later efforts at Presarius. No viable explanation for the Fornax Alf vanishings has ever been made. Certainly, as various sources have suggested, the influence of the warp storm disturbance afflicted the area should not be discounted. At the time of writing, Fornax Alf has been garrisoned by the Imperium for 15 years, and a program of recolonization is underway to repopulate the empty hives. No further vanishings have been experienced or any other significant strangeness, although reports of unexplained screams in the dead of night continue to this day. The vanishings of Fornax Alf. Oh dear. Yo, what the fuck? Oh no. Don't go here. <laughs> Unfortunately, some people are born here. And I'm sure that the horrible screamings in the dead of night is not on the brochure. <laughs> it 
reminds me of that short story I told you a while ago with the oh, scream singer. Yeah, 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 yeah. The scream singers. And it's just like, yeah, they're there. Don't they're worry there. about Everybody it. Everybody knows about them. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's uh, fine. Every time they show up, somebody disappears, like literally that, that, from that, that, their lover's normal. arms. It's but normal. It's normal. I'll that's just it. how it is here. I'll put that short story. In. I'll link it in the description. It's very, very good. Yeah. This is very... Donna Noble has been saved. Donna Noble has left the li- or has left the library. Yeah, it's you arrive to some place that, for all intents and purposes, should be extremely populated, and you get there, and there's no one, and it, they're, everybody's gone. But it's not just that they're gone; it's as if they didn't leave; they just weren't there anymore. They were Thanos snapped, and yeah. suddenly no one is at Four Next So okay, is there teleportation in yes. Warhammer? Like Star Trek style. Teleporting exists. And it is just your physical body goes from one place to another via like a... Like a homing device. Okay. Like when you buy a kit of Terminators, it's five Terminators and you get a little homing device. Okay. So you can have a cute little token to be like, I put my homing device here and that's where the Terminators are going to come in in the next turn. Yeah. It's like a little gate. Yeah. Okay. It's a signal so that the teleporter can lock onto it. Yeah. God forbid you're standing there. When they teleport in. Right. So trying to come up with an explanation, it's almost as if they were just teleported away. But that doesn't explain the human hand that was calcified. And also the fact that no electricity and the most disturbing part of the story, in my opinion, A, the eeriness of the capital ship just kind of floating into the sun. It's not on the planet. It's also the ships that were in orbit. There's this great documentary, and I can't remember what it's called exactly, but it is called something like If Humans Disappeared. And it's basically like if suddenly Thanos snapped, but everybody, yeah. what happens to the world over the course of an hour, a day, a year, I think I've five seen that. years, 10 years? Yeah. And it goes over like, well, this is when buildings start deteriorating. This is when the electricity turns off. Yeah. So, and it kind of reminded me of that because, like, electricity, depending on how you're making it, it doesn't stop right away. The machines are going, right? Yeah. But eventually, something needs to be fixed. Something needs to be turned off and on or something. Something will shut down at some point. Yeah. And I think in this documentary, it said it was two or three days before, like, general city Mm -hmm. electricity stopped. Yeah. So, like, the fact that they were able to, like, turn the electricity on again, that reminded me of that because it just needs a human intervention, basically. Like, somebody to fix whatever happened. Mm -hmm. My theory here is, like, they moved, whereas it could very well be that they disintegrated. We don't know. The only evidence we have... And this is my other favorite thing about this story. It's the image of a tank. Yeah. 80 stories high on a building. Because how the fuck did it get up there? And also inside of that tank, not only is there a calcified hand, like still on the lever. Yeah. The headphone connectors are cut off, but they're also like fused together. So what the fuck happened there? It almost feels like there was like a Mandela effect and the universe got swapped with a universe where they weren't there. Which, given that there were significant warp storms, Mm -hmm. that could be the case. Yeah. Maybe there's a universe somewhere where- Nobody lives here. Nobody's there, but now everybody has turned up there. And it's a bit Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, it's this mysterious, we don't exactly know what happened. But you got displaced in time or in space, or I mean, I'm assuming displacement, it could just be vaporized. That too. That comet did come down, and it specifically says demon or demon things came out of the planet, came out of the comet. They were probably on it, and then they crashed, caused a nuclear winter, and they came like swarming out. It's very what happened in fantasy when the gates collapsed. Yeah. And then like a hole opened up in the world and the demons came pouring out. I mean, it's very third impact. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Especially with it being the two poles. Yeah. I absolutely love this story. I think it's the perfect amount of mysterious, eerie, Mm -hmm. and like, it's just creepy because of what we've been talking about. Like, where did they go? Yeah. There was a whole population here and we get here. There's no one there. Okay, I deploy with my 16,000 men. The Space Marines get there. They're gone. Yeah. What? Yeah. What happened? And the only thing to link it is the electricity. Mm-hmm. That weird instance. And the fact that there are just random blood-curdling screams yeah, in the, the middle of the night. It is very confusing. Because also... You would think that you could like 
follow the screen. You would think you could take some basic sound tech and mm. like know what direction they're coming from. But according to what they said here, no source was ever found. So they probably did do that. Yeah. They probably had like whole squads, platoons, probably had people looking up and Conrad down. Conrad is just fucking circling this planet laughing as he's playing over <laughs> a megaphone. A, there's one silly night lord who is like, I have the best prank. I got just the thing. Guys. You have no idea. It could also be a Drukari. Yeah. Who like, they've got this funny little planet that they've set up to where it's just every so often I hit this button and it screams and it freaks them the fuck out. And that's great for me. They're like going over the the area in the video game that turns on the sound effect for the cuts. Oh, they're just like hitting a mute button over and over (laughs) again. And it's just like, I'll hit him next week with this. They ain't going to expect it. I'm going to make it. I'm going to crank the gain on this to like plus 100 and it's going to freak everybody out. It's just Germa activating that baby that hits the wall over and over again. (laughs) Yeah. How would you describe on a spooky level Fornax out? I mean, it's spooky. It is. It's very much the kind of story I like, like one of my favorite episodes of Doctor Who. In fact, the first the episode library. I showed you yeah, the to library. get you into it is The Silence in the Library. It's great. Which feels very much like this. So it's actually kind of funny that we both independently came to a story with a similar mystery. Absolutely. And of course, you and I know how that story Ends. wraps up and what was the cause and stuff. Yes. Um, but what if there wasn't an answer and it was just, yeah, and like, it's empty. At least for now, we don't have any clue. Mm-hmm. Really, and also that, the screaming, the screaming, and also bad. the screaming. I mean, you I don't. S- so why are we continuing to colonize this world? It's ours. Okay, great. Once again, you are bringing logic to the Imperium. I'm sorry. How dare you, uh, Inquisitor? No, Inquisitor, give her a nice treat. Oh, <laughs> I like a treat. Give her a pleasant meal. Oh, del- oh club sandwich. <laughs> Um, you can see why I saved this one for last. Right. Because not only is it my favorite, it is like, I think personally, the spookiest story out of what we have talked about today. Yeah. It's also like the most story-ish. Well, I literally read from the place that it was from. If you would like to check this out, the book that I am reading that excerpt of is called The Sabbat World Crusade. You can probably find a way to read it online. It feels a bit like SCP. That's what I was like. Yeah. And I mean, SCP is all about unexplainable yeah. occurrences and anomalies. And that's a good way to describe what Fornax Alpha is. It is an anomaly. Yeah. And I just, I love it so dearly. Mm-hmm. So it is definitely my favorite story that we have talked about today. Yeah, Would spooker. you say that you agree? I do. It's spooky, it is right? Spooky. Yeah. I have a surprise for you, though. What's that? I have an even spookier Warhammer thing. What's that? Okay, I'm going to give you instructions. Okay. I want you to go to the Warhammer website. Okay. Okay, I'm on the Warhammer website. Uh, I want you to go to the models you would want to buy. Okay. Okay. I I would like these cute little Okay. Now I want you to brace yourself. Okay, I'm bracing. I want you to look at the price. (gasps) Oh! Hey. Hey, guys. Guys, I'm thoroughly spooked out. Let us know if you have any theories of what went on in Fornax Elf. Yeah, what the hell? We want to hear about it. Or if you have anything else to add that is proper spooky. Yeah, what are some of your favorite spooper things? Yeah, let us know. Give us ideas for next year. Yeah. And beyond. And beyond. And in the meantime, guys, have a happy and safe Halloween. We will see you all in the next video. Yeah. We're going to have poo-poo mics again because we recorded it before this microphone upgrade so nurgle mic it'll be a bit nurgly but that's okay that's okay nurgle loves you it's true he do have a wonderful halloween everyone stay safe eat lots of candy treat yourself yeah have a good time drink responsibly if you do that if you're of age don't just randomly disappear with no explanation don't do that don't do that i would i don't become a couch we will see you all in the next one take care Ooh. Oh, $62. <laughs> <laughs>